Jonah was furious. He lost his temper. He yelled at God, God, I knew it. When I was back home, I knew that this was going to happen. That's why I ran off to Tarshish. I knew you were sheer grace and mercy, not easily angered, rich in love, and ready at the drop of a hat to turn your plans of punishment into a program of forgiveness. So God, if you won't kill them, kill me. I'm better off dead. God said, what do you have to be angry about? But Jonah just left. He went out of the city to the east and sat down in a sulk. He put together a makeshift shelter of leafy branches and sat there in the shade to see what would happen to the city. God arranged for a broad-leafed tree to spring up. It grew over Jonah to cool him off and get him out of his angry sulk. Jonah was pleased and enjoyed the shade. Life was looking up. But then God sent a worm. By dawn of the next day, the worm had bored into the shade tree and it withered away. The sun came up and God sent a hot, blistering wind from the east. The sun beat down on Jonah's head and he started to faint. He prayed to die. I'm better off dead. Then God said to Jonah, what right do you have to get angry about this shade tree? Jonah said, plenty of right. It made me angry enough to die. God said, what's this? How is it that you can change your feelings from pleasure to anger overnight about a mere shade tree that you did nothing to get? You neither planted nor watered it. It grew up one night and died the next night. So why can't I likewise change what I feel about Nineveh from anger to pleasure? This big city of more than 120,000 childlike people who don't yet know right from wrong, to say nothing of all the innocent animals. May my words be your words, Lord, and if they are not your words, may only your words be heard. I know that this uh, passage is familiar to you, having been preached on just a few weeks ago, but bear with me. <laughs> Jonah was right glad of God's mercy when he was in the belly of the fish, but it would appear that he does not want that mercy extended to others who are not of his own kind. Do you see that in the world today? Jonah is angry with God for not destroying the Assyrian capital. So angry he wants to die. On the first reading of the book of Jonah, I thought that Jonah's attitudes and his about Jonah's attitudes and his tendency to death wishes. But the passage which especially spoke to me this time is that last bit where Jonah is angry about the death of the shade plant, the part where God notes that Jonah has shown concern for the shade plant and then asks why Jonah objects to his creator's concern for the population of Nineveh including the children and the animals. Thinking on your theme of gather us in, my thoughts shifted to the contrast between Jonah and Noah. In Jonah's story, God was upset with the wickedness of Nineveh, the great colonial power of that day. In Noah's day, God was frustrated with the wickedness of all humanity and regretted having created us. God planned a great flood to wipe out life on earth, but Noah found favor in God's eyes. The, sor the story does not say that Jonah spoke to his neighbors and asked them to change their ways so that God's mind might be changed, but I like to think that he did that before he built the big boat and gathered his family and all the animals. Noah understands that God cares for all of creation. 
Jonah appears to believe that God's concern should be limited to Israel as the chosen people and finds it hard to believe that God might also love the people of Nineveh. That God might also care about plants and animals in the city has not occurred to Jonah. Human history reflects the temptation to think that God has favorites and that one belongs to, the favor to a group that is favored above others. On this assumption that God has favorites, we build our hierarchies and seek places in the higher tiers. What if God is truly egalitarian? and greatly concerned for those at the bottom of our status heaps. What if the us in Gather Us In includes the whole web of life? Our Christian theology has become too human-centric. We have read the first creation story in Genesis, thinking that the whole world was created just for us and for our pleasure. We do not get the message that we are part of an intricate web of life with a special responsibility for tending the web and keeping it healthy. The opening of Genesis, the story of Noah, and this passage proclaim God's concern not only for humanity, but for all the creatures of the earth. They reminded me of messages God sent to the indigenous people of this land. Yes, I believe that the God who is still speaking has been sending messages and messengers for countless ages. Tomorrow, October 9th, is Indigenous Peoples Day, the US celebration of indigenous American peoples, a commemoration of their histories and cultures. I'm inclined to invite you to do some research into that history and the disastrous consequences, consequences that continue to the present day of something called the doctrine of discovery. This doctrine is rooted in papal proclamations of Christian dominion over non-Christian peoples, which became embedded in our legal system and underlies our national myth of manifest destiny. When Europeans first came to this continent, Thomas Berry writes, quote, the indigenous people of this continent tried to teach us the value of the land, but unfortunately we could not understand them, blinded as we were by our dream of manifest destiny. Instead, we were scandalized because they insisted on living simply rather than working industriously. We desired to teach them our ways, never thinking that they could teach us theirs. We never experienced the land as they did, as a living presence, not primarily to be used, but to be revered and communed with." Unquote. I would invite us to reflect today on some of the spiritual gems of those indigenous cultures. When I moved to South Dakota to live among the Lakota people, from whom we got that first hymn, I often heard the expression, Mikatuye Oyasin, a phrase which translates in English as, all my relatives, or we are all related. It is a prayer of oneness and harmony with all forms of life, other people, animals, birds, insects, trees, plants, rivers, rocks, mountains, and valleys. It recognizes the divine spirit of life breathed into the universe, permeating all that is, and that this divine spirit connects us so that we are all related to each other. 
The Lakota believe that everything was created for a purpose and each one has its place in the circle of life. Animals and fish are seen as relatives who give themselves to people for food. This is a gift honored with prayers and ceremonies. I remember how my great grandmother would honor the chicken or the rabbit that was prepared for our Sunday dinner with a prayer of thanks that it had given itself to feed us. No part of these gifts is to be wasted. Whenever possible, these gifts are shared, starting with the elderly and the infirm, so that in a traditional tribe, no one goes hungry. Before Western settlers came, forests and grasslands were tended to meet the needs of these animals so that these relatives would live nearby. The insects, plants, rivers, soil, and rocks were also respected. Here in the Northwest, Chief Seattle told the settlers who came here, the earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to the earth. All things are connected like the blood which unites us all. Man did not weave the bread of the web of life. He is merely a strand within it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself." Unquote. The earth is our mother, not a resource to be exploited. Those who came to mine for coal and gold or to plow the land did not comprehend the deep spiritual significance of Mother Earth for local tribes. Smohala, a spiritual leader from the Columbia Plateau area, explained, quote, You ask me to plow the ground? Shall I take a knife and tear my mother's breast? Then when I die, she will not take me to her bosom to rest. You ask me to dig for stone. Shall I dig under her skin for her bones? Then when I die, I cannot enter her body to be born again. You ask me to cut grass and make hay and sell it and be rich like white men. But how dare I cut off my mother's hair? Unquote. Indigenous spirituality is steeped in respect for the natural world and a devotion to studying and understanding the land and her creatures. Chief Dan George of the Slail Watus Nation, a Coast Salish band has told us, if you walk, if you talk to the animals, they will talk with you and you will know each other. If you do not talk to them, you will not know them. And what you do not know, you will fear. What one fears, one destroys." Unquote. I believe that the European lack of understanding and fear of what was foreign to them have played a huge role in our wars on native peoples and our destruction of native cultures. Our preference for the familiar and our introduction of non-native species have led to the decimation and annihilation of many indigenous plants and animals on whom the people depended. How different the world would be if we respected, observed, and learned from the natural world. We could learn from the eagles to share equitably in the tasks of parenting. From the geese, the importance of shared leadership. Christians were not always disconnected from nature and heedless of her ways. Reverence for all of creation was a hallmark of Celtic Christianity. The Celts embraced nature, divinity, the natural world, and human existence as equal partners in one interconnected whole. They too saw animals as our brothers and sisters. 
wells were sacred places and streams the tears of earth's joy and despair. We remember St. Francis and Brother Sun and Sister Moon. And the, in the medieval times, Hildegard von Bingen talked about veriditas, the greening power of life. In recent times, Christian theology found a renewed connection to the natural world in the works of Thierry de Chardin, a French priest and anthropologist. Missed a page. <laughs> Thomas Berry, a cultural historian with a vision for transformative social change and environmental renewal. Sally McFaig, an American feminist theologian, and Brian Swim, a professor of evolutionary cosmology. Thomas Berry warns, has warned us, quote, the most difficult transition to make is from an anthropocentric to a biocentric norm of progress. If there is to be any true progress, then the entire life community must progress. Any progress of the human at the expense of the larger life community must ultimately lead to a diminishment of human life itself." Unquote. He called for a restoration of biodiversity, since out of an estimated 8 million species known on Earth, 1 million are currently on the brink of extinction. We are entering the fastest era of extinction that we know of. I do find hope in these writings, in a new awareness brought about by climate change of our impact on the whole web of life, and in callings at gatherings like the recent Parliament of World's Religions for us to seek the wisdom of those who understand their role as water protectors, forest guardians, caretakers of land, sea, air, and all that live upon this globe. I find hope in the movement called regenerative agriculture. The call to care for the innocent children, to plan for the survival and prosperity of generations not yet born, and to cease abusing oppressing and exploiting the earth and her creatures is urgent. At the same time, we must move with care, constantly studying and communicating as best we can with all of God's creatures and watching out for unintended consequences. We're not always as smart as we think. I wish I could tell you that I have a perfect solution, but preachers are not all-knowing. Yet each person knows something, some way of restoring balance and caring for God's beautiful creation. So I invite you to reflect for a moment and then turn to someone near you to share some practical bit of wisdom concerning how we can honor God in restoring balance and harmony. In a few minutes, I will invite those who wish to share what they have learned so that we may all be wiser stewards and better lovers of God's glorious creation. The rest of this sermon is yours. Yeah. <laughs>